and I'll talk about the future of identity and cybersecurity is policy based. And I take a, a bit of different approach this morning, which is whiteboard, so to speak. So, so w when, I, when I start thinking about topics, um, then I very frequently use a whiteboard. So sometimes on paper, sometimes I use the whiteboard app. Um, and so I, I, I want to walk a bit through, through my, my thinking on, on a whiteboard about policies and why I believe they are important and how to make them work, etc. cetera. So um, it looks a bit like PowerPoint, but you'll see um, PowerPoint is the, the minor part of what is about to come in the next minute. So we had a lot of talk about policies. We had a lot of, lot of talk about authorization and authorization really, yes, there's a lot of talk about pass keys, et cetera, but I think when we go a bit more towards the future, then authorization is the, the hot topic. Finally, or again, we had it a couple of years ago. Um, and in that space, but beyond that, uh, policies play a very, very important role. And th the nice thing with policies is they have a standard structure that is very simple to understand. So this is about the subject, action, object, and maybe constraint or, or, or context. And Yes, the constraint, the context that could be complex that allows in some way also for nesting, saying, okay, this relates to another policy. Um, policies can have these relationships where you say, okay, one policy or a, a chain of policies are required to, to in fact allow something. So take Martin. I, I took the slim version, by the way, of Martin here, as you can see. Um, yeah, there might be a policy that controls the access to a building. There might be a policy that uh, co uh, controls the access to a computer. Uh, there might be a firewall policy and so on. So many, many more and, and more complex relationships. But policies, and I think this is something which already becomes clear here, policies are something that is ubiquitous um, to identity, to cybersecurity and well beyond. It's something we find in our daily life. A, a, lo a lot of things we express as a policy, child, better don't touch the hot oven, um, subject, action, object, um, etc. So it's something everyone understands. And as I've said, they are widely used. They are ubiquitous. So when we look at these ubiquitous policies, then we have firewall policies. Uh, we, know. we have authentication policies. So when you look at the typical access management solution, that we are using policies for decades. Um, we not necessarily name these policies, but at the end it is. We have SOD policies. We have policies in birthright provisioning. We have whatever the building access, so physical uh, building access policies. Yeah, we have some cybersecurity policies, but not always. We use policies as widely as we can. So maybe it's not the very best example yet. Um, authorization, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, was policy based, but unfortunately, um, it was XML based as well. Um, so in that combination, it didn't succeed as, as expected. We have zero trust. When you look at the big zero trust picture of NIST, then their policy theme is very much uh, at the center. We have ESG, so environmental, uh, social governance. We have export control policy. So policies are all over the place. And I think policy have, have, can have a very huge impact on what we are doing. So, so when we go into to IGA, so the Identity Governance and Administration, User Life Cycles, Identity Provisioning, Access Governance piece, um, the areas where we have policies, I believe, are the ones which are rather simple to use. Um, but they are, that's maybe the problem, too many areas without policies. So policies in IGA, when we look at this, um, so first, let's start with the bad thing in IGA. Bad standing privileges or static entitlements. This is what is, as I, as I think I said it a couple of times during the conference, this is the root cause of all bad in identity management. Um, so this is what really creates challenges. So the complex role management things, they are here because we have to deal with standing privileges across a lot of applications. 
recertification is so, well, let's say, name it ugly, uh, because <laughs> it is about the standing privileges and that the good thing are dynamic policy-based trust and time, and shit is not shit, um, <laughs> access, the automated part. This is really the good thing here. Um, and there are things which are simple and proven. So birthright provisioning, which we can do, um, where we use a, maybe an organizational role, a business role, an organizational, so which department is someone in the location, other attributes. That is something that can work and that can work well. Um, we can also use this, by the way, if, we, if something changes, this could uh, impact the mover process even. By the way, I have, I have a rule here, and I believe, uh, I'm con convinced also from, from my experience that this can be matched this value. The rule is that at least 90% of the entitlements someone has should be assigned, automated by rules. So the manual access entitlements, the manually requested access entitlements should be below 10%. So this is the threshold I define here. You should compare where, with where you are. And I strongly believe this can be achieved. Um, there are SOD rules, yes, so we have areas, but managing all the static entitlements and legacy software, AD, SAP, homegrown software, Salesforce, that is a challenge. This morning, uh, when I was standing in front of the mirror shaving, uh, one thought passed my mind. So we, we see all these upcoming regulations also around um, sort of security by design. Honestly, I believe a part of everything around security by design should be no static entitlements anymore. Software that is built with static entitlements is not to my understanding, in compliance with security by design, because it's secure, insecure by design. So, in fact, we must change this. Okay, it's a bold statement, but I think, I, 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 I'm pretty sure that I'm more on the right than on the wrong side with that statement. We'll come back to this, this IGA thing later, by the way. So, um, can policies, simplify legacy IGA approaches. This is always the point, and I remember, so there's one person in the room, I, I had a conversation probably some six, seven, eight years ago about trust and time access and, and the, the hope of um, uh, getting away from, from these standing privileges, um, Olaf Greve. Um, and I think there's always the, the point that comes up, not from him, uh, that is so complex to do. So, so policies for legacy. So what we have today, we have users. We put the users in groups or roles, which are groups with entitlements. And these entitlements, in fact, are um, subjects and actions that are assigned to a user or group, for instance, for files. So this is this static mapping in a bit of a simplified manner, but it's basically this. What we could do is we could say we have the users. We put them into groups. And we have sets of entitlements still. And what we can do is we can, for a session, so if we use the authentication or the information from the access management system, or not perfect but doable for a certain time, do sort of a dynamic bin binding where we say the subject, which could be an individual or a group, is we bind it to that specific sort of set of entitlements. So that might, may require, like we had in, when we go back to SAML or so, where we frequently had this, okay, we map that user from the other organization to a technical account. Not, not, not the most beautiful solution, but better than setting entitlements at the end of the day, because we, we don't have this permanent binding anymore. So there are ways to overcome this. And I, I really ask the, the, the people from the IGA vendors in the room to think about it. How can we at least add a bit of trust in time? And policy-based assignments, policy-based dynamic bindings to IGA. This is not rocket science. This is doable. So do it and make the world a bit better because that will also reduce the number of recertifications that need to be done and you will really make your customers happy. Authentication policies. That's where, where everything's here. We're doing it. Um, 
what we mainly do is we do a bit of a cost grain thing. Okay, Martin is allowed to, to do that and that, but we have there. So we have the authentication policies that are well established. Um, a bit too fast. So adaptive authentication, we have uh, the context we use, so device, behavior, um, location. Uh, I think I wrote yesterday, maybe we call behavior better identity threat because identity threat, every, so everyone says, oh, it's scary, we must do something. When you say user behavior, uh, some, some will say, oh, they are tracking the users. So the connotation of these terms is a bit different, even while there's a lot of similarity in. Uh, and we match this to risk, and then we decide about step up authentication, et cetera. We have OAuth scopes, which are a bit of a cost grain access control. We could make them a bit more granular, which is happening in several areas. We see upcoming extensions to OAuth. We see uh, what happens in the, um, uh, in the, the, in, in the banking, open banking space. So it's all here, and we have, that's something I have really to say, we have a lot of cool, uh, cool orchestration tools out there right now to say, okay, we implement these policies in the access flow and the, the journey. So there's a lot of things there. And this is maybe a good blueprint also for some other areas because we, at the end, the industry knows how to do things. We have the authorization policies uh, with the PXP triangle, uh, more the old fashioned way. It's a proven model. It's definitely not wrong. Even while I call it old-fashioned here, that might be a bit unfair. It's specifically, it's way too rarely used. So these authorization policies in, in the old style, they are a user goes to an application, the application connects with a PEP. I'll bring up the terms in a minute. Um, there's a PDP, the policy decision point, uh, which receives information from PIPs, like, like a, a database or an LDAP directory. Um, there's the repository point with the policies in, there's a policy administration point where the admin then is working on the policies. And as I've said, there are a lot of P P's with something in between, like the enforcement decision information repository administration, etc. So this is something we have seen around for, for, for a while. Uh, when you look at XACML, it's basically this. Some of that you'll find when you look at the NIST zero trust policy thing, etc. When we Look at it uh, a bit more in the modern way. So OPA not being perfect, no, no doubt, but being widely used. Um, by developers of digital services, interestingly, because what you see with OPA is people like it if they don't need to care about the authorization piece when developing software. So better you, let's use something that cares for that instead of reinventing the five-edged wheel again and again. So the digital service developers like it. They, they also like using identity services. Um, they like to build against APIs instead of reinventing everything. So in, in that way, so we have the users. And, and then there are, they, that could be also users could be so maybe I should have put in some, some non, so they are not that human when I paint them, sure. They not even look really like humans, but I maybe should have put in some, some silicon identities here as well, because a lot of these sort of accounts or identities are uh, factually services, accessing resources, but on the other hand, very frequently on behalf of, of humans. So I could have also created a big painting around identity relationships. Um, which, by the way, sometimes happen when I do these whiteboard things and I start painting and then I add something and then after a few minutes no one can read it anymore because it's, um, it becomes too complex. So I try to keep these things a, a bit leaner um, and ap apologize for my handwriting. By the way, Jörg always said I could have become a doctor uh, with my handwriting. Um, so we have the resources. The, Components, the applications, databases, etc. They have APIs, and then there's a service service mesh again, access via APIs. We have the open policy agent, JSON queries for for asking for, for the decisions. Again, we have a policy store. We have a language to describe policies. And we have data stores, which are factually policy information points, uh, like the whatever Azure Active Directory, 
not sure what the name is today of the Azure Active Directory, but probably tomorrow it's another one. The database and, and a lot of other things. Um, so th this is um, the scenario we have, but basically it's, it's a very similar scenario because in the end we have a policy enforcement, you have policy decisions, you have policy repositories, you have everything there as well. Um, we need these, we need policies for automation for dynamic workloads because we can't keep in control of this complexity. Um, wh when we have DevOps where applications are constantly changing, delivered to the execution environment, which is for itself again very complex, with a lot of components we use, we need this. So um, this is also the, the key or dream challenge here. So we have um, nowadays, Compared, for instance, to traditional privileged access management, we have many services compared to few human users. We have many resources compared to a few Windows and Linux servers and applications. We have a dynamic world. We have, an, from infrastructure as a service, an elastic world with workloads going up and down. So we need policy-based automation. Otherwise, we will fail. We can't handle a dynamic, agile environment with static and principles. This will not work. And honestly, we're always talking about the complexity of identity management, so we need to apply it everywhere because everything is complex and dynamic and so on. T take organizational changes. So you have your IGA and then the organization changes. You, you build your role model and in, until you're done after three years, you had two fundamental organizational changes already. Um, that's not so dynamic, but even too dynamic for what we are doing. The policies are at the core of the zero trust architecture, so I repainted the picture from the NIST here. Uh, basically, something where we also have a PEP and PDP and PEP and so on. Um, basically, a very similar picture. Broader than identity, but basically the same thing. So, you have a lot of systems helping in verification, so you need to turn your head a bit to read it like AM, Siem, and SIR, and you have more systems helping there. So you get a lot of data, a lot of signals here that help you in, in, in doing that, that can be consumed for making decisions. What else? Policies and decentralized identity, a perfect match, absolutely. So we have the wallet with the proofs. I, as, as you all have learned, I tend to use that term, decentralized identity, because I've I believe it describes everything well. Take the, whichever term you want, I'll stick with, to that one. Um, and I don't want to discuss about what is the exactly correct term for what. It doesn't help us to, to, to really move forward. Um, we have a service. Uh, we need authentication and authorization in that service. So Martin opens the wallet with a strong authentication. It doesn't work with this finger back because I have a Blaster here, <laughs> so fingerprint doesn't work well uh, with, with that sum. Um, so number two is I, I, so to speak, open the wallet. I, the access to the proofs is there. Um, I already have some some proof that I had a strong authentication, and I can authorize via proof. So if I have certain proofs, I can use them in a policy. I can use them for that. So it's it's a really logical match here. What do we need to do? Um, we need to make this entire thing work, and this will require a multi-speed approach in organizations. That's something we should be very clear. We can use policies all over the place, but some things are easier to do now, and others will take a bit longer. So think in a multi-speed approach, but start with your conceptual work now. Um, look at the standards and to the community work, continue working on the standards, continue improving them. We need better software, so to speak, security by design, privacy by design. We need policy life cycles. So a policy without a life cycle, is, that's not a good idea. We need the life cycles for creating, changing, etc. Ownership. We need policy governance. And with policy governance, we need data governance because the point is we have a policy and so recertification policies are simple. They are easy to understand. They are not too many. But the point is, data is used, the stuff from the PIP, to make the decision. And this is what we need to bring together. 
we need the data governance piece as well. So we as identity people need to care more about data governance and start talking with data people. Not only for that, for many other reasons as well. And we need to do this in different speeds. For OPA digital services, we can start now. But we should, should build the framework, the governance framework and the, the management framework now for everything when we proceed and move forward. I'm perfectly on time. Thank you for listening to me. <laughs> Okay, um, if I can switch this on, I'll check quickly whether, oh, wrong session here, whether there are questions in here. It looks like he has, he doesn't show me the questions currently, unfortunately. Uh, maybe I can manage this. Um, here we go. Q&A. Okay, there are questions. Um, so let's look, maybe we take one. Oh, what to do with clients, organizations dealing with more than 5,000 different roles, still not recognizing they have a problem? I think this is one, one interesting question to pick. So, so, so the point is, you know, I think many of, of you right now will say, hey, only 5,000? Where's the problem? <laughs> um, I've seen way, 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 way bigger numbers of roles. Um, I, I think, honestly, I think everyone knows that roles are challenging. Because once you've gone through a role management project, you've learned something about it. And I think also, Recertification, I still haven't met a single organization worldwide which said, hey, my departmental managers are, are really waiting for the next recertification re campaign because it's the biggest fun in their life. I haven't heard about that yet. Um, so so I, I, I think that the point is that that's probably more the, the lack of an answer on how could we solve it? What can we do to address this? And I think this is what we need to look at. How can we solve it? I hope I gave you some ideas around that. How can we get better, which needs the help of the industry, the help of all the software vendors, and of us as identity professionals to make it work. So I thank you. I'm the one standing between you and the coffee, so I'll let you go to the coffee break now and see you later again. Thank you.